let's uh, take our Bibles and look at Proverbs chapter 12. Remember, as we get into this portion of the Proverbs, um, Solomon is just, there's really, there's no thematic, if you will, uh, passages in this portion of Proverbs that, that we might go through where Solomon has one central idea. Again, I, as I've read the Proverbs through this time around in my life, I'm, I'm realizing that there's a distinction between righteousness and holiness. And Solomon is talking so much about the consequence or the results uh, of a, in the life of a person who's living a righteous, a right life in contrast with the person who's not living a righteous life. And while we know that we as believers, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, we have been made right with God through Jesus, the fact is we don't always live in righteousness. And so um, the application of these wicked verses really could be applied to us as well, that, that in our walk and in our life, we want to walk rightly. We want to worship God through all of our being, um, that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to him. He's the writer in Hebrews says, uh, excuse me, Paul says in Romans, and this is our reasonable act of worship. Paul also says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So our desire is to, is to, is to glorify God through right living. Um, our desire should never be to impress other people through our right living. Our desire should never be to compare our lives, our walk with other people. I call that comparative Christianity. And comparative Christianity is probably one of the devil's greatest schemes. That, that I can always find people around me that are, that are not uh, believers around me that, that may not be as right as I am or as righteous as I am. And I can also find believers around me who are far in my eyes, they seem to be far more righteous than me. But the Bible says that each man stands or falls before his own creator. And so you and I have to have the, the idea, the mindset that, that we're living our lives unto God and he is the only judge to judge us right or to judge us unrighteous in our actions. Um, and remember, God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And you and I cannot see a person's heart. We, we may say, you know, um, that we know that person's motives, but we don't always know that person's motives. Only the Holy Spirit can discern that. And so we have to leave that up to him. Um, I've met in my life a lot of little Holy Spirits in the church uh, that run around um, trying to make everybody else right. We're to encourage one another in a walk of righteousness, but we can't make anybody right. Listen, I have enough sin in my own heart and life to worry about, to worry about everybody else's. Amen? Uh, can you say amen to that if you're listening? If you agree with that, will you say amen? We have enough sin in our lives uh, to be concerned about us and not concerned about everybody else. So, with all of that, Proverbs chapter 12. He begins in writing verse 1, that whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Um, God disciplines us, according to the Bible, that we might share in his righteousness. Hebrews chapter 10, I think it is, that our earthly fathers disciplined us as they knew best, but God disciplines us for our good so that we might share in his righteousness. And so when we love the one who appreciates the Lord's discipline, I hear the idea of discipline is correction, to make right, to make correct. So when we're not walking in a righteous path or there's uh, work that God wants to do in us to conform us to the likeness of Christ. He will discipline. He will train us. Sometimes God uses numerous things to do that in our lives. As a matter of fact, I think God uses every instance in our life that he wants to discipline and train us to walk in righteousness. Verse 2, a good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devises, uh, the, but a man of evil devices, he condemns. And so, uh, when, we, when we're living right, it, we find favor in God's eyes. But a man of evil devices, God condemns. No one, is, no one is established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will, be, uh, will never be moved. In other words, we can't establish a life in wickedness. We have to establish a life in righteousness and right by the precepts of the word of God. 
Verse 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. And I will say amen to that. Uh, Sandy is my crown. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness to his bones. Um, it's easy for me to contrast that because I, I, I think of how, 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 how excellent Sandy is as a wife. Um, but one who brings shame is like rottenness to his bones. Shame on his name. Shame in the marriage. Who defiles the marriage vows, you might say. Um, she is, uh, she brings shame is like the rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are just. The counsels of the wicked are deceitful. Um, the thoughts of the righteous are just. Why are the thoughts of the righteous just? Because the righteous person's thoughts are established on the truths of the word of God. And God is always just. God is a just God. We cry and we want justice, but the question really comes, do we really want justice? Um, the, the thoughts of the righteous are just, but the counsel of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright delivers them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. You remember Jesus said, um, there were two houses that were built. One was built on, on shifting on sand, and the other was built on a rock. And when the winds and the storms of life came along, that house that was built on sand was destroyed. But the house that was established on the rock stood. And so when we establish our lives on the righteousness of God, his precepts and his word, that when the storms of life come, it's going to stand. Um, but the house of the righteous will stand. The wicked will be overthrown no more. A man is condemned according to his, excuse me, a man is commended according to his good sense. But one of twisted mind is despised. Think about that. A man is commended according to his good sense. But one of twisted mind is despised. Better to be lowly and have a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. Whoever is righteous has regard for his li the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Verse 11, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Common sense here. The man who works his land, the man who works with his hands, the man who works, he says he'll have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Those worthless pursuits can be those joys of life and, and, and those become a priority rather than work. Uh, the pursuit of happiness, uh, the pursuit of pleasure. My goodness, don't we live in a country that there's a pursuit of pleasure? Um, that person lacks sense. Uh, it could be a person that's always going after riches. The quick buck, uh, that person lacks sense. Whoever is wicked covets the spoil of evildoers, but the root of the righteous bears fruit. An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous escapes from trouble. Lastly, verse 14, from the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good, and the work of a man's hand comes back to him. So here again, the the the, the contrast, the theme of, of this section of Proverbs is the righteous and the wicked. I'd encourage you to do this today. We breeze through the ver those verses, but read each one of those verses this morning and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is there something that needs to be corrected in my life based on this? Am I pursuing the wrong things? Am I pursuing the wrong relationship? Do I have pride in my own righteousness? God, all of these questions, ask the Lord uh, those things and let the Holy Spirit conform you and transform you and move you more to the likeness of Christ. Well, today, let's pray and ask God uh, that he would give us an opportunity as we're intentional to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart, to cultivate a seed that's already been planted there, perhaps. And God, by his grace, man, if he would allow us to participate in seeing someone come to know Christ, that's my prayer. I want to see somebody saved today. I, I want to watch God save them. And so, Lord, help me to be intentional at every avenue and every turn that I go. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.